and welcome to Word Alive. I'm Rachel Rogers, and we are so glad that you have joined us today. You know, if you missed yesterday's program, we had an incredible teaching from Dr. David Thomas, and he is with us the the rest of this week. And so if you missed it, you can always go back and look at it on archive, but we are going to be continuing Uh, the teaching with that today. But as always, the number is at the bottom of your screen. That's our prayer line. We have prayer partners that are here that want to pray for you. They want to agree that God has you in his, the palm of his hand. So they just want to pray for you today. That number is at the bottom of your screen. It's 502-962-9650. But before we get into the teaching today, uh, today we're going to be talking about Matthew 24 and the upheavals of, of that passage and what it has to do with this time, that the period that we're living in. So you don't want to go anywhere. But we're first going to go into worship. I am a huge uh, supporter, a, a huge believer that worship, especially in the morning, when you get your day going, it's something that sets your mind, your body at rest. It, it, it's something that, you know, uh, I've talked about power posing and that there was a study that came out in years ago in, in uh, the Smithsonian. And they said that there's certain things that you do that, that when you do those things, that there's fear, this anxiety, all these things subside in your body. But the biggest one was the position of worship. And when you position yourself in worship, it sets your mind at rest. It sets your body at rest. It sets fear and anxiety leave. And so we're going to go into a time of worship right now and just get alone with God. Let God minister to you and just worship him as we go to that right now. love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Goodness of God. 
You know, that's such a good song, Faithful. All of my life, he's been faithful. God's always been faithful. And so um, to, to recap a little bit about what we talked about yesterday, you know, Dr. David Thomas is with us, and we're so glad that you're with us on Word Alive. But yesterday we were talking about some of the, the frantic, maybe, teaching that uh, that's been talked about through the decades with the churches of, of Jesus is coming back this year, this day, this time. And so it's been, an, uh, I, I said a roller coaster. It's been up and down with uh, emotions with the church and with, with different times. But, but you laid a foundation yesterday, and I encourage you, if, if you missed it, go back on our archive. You can go back to uh, BobRogersMinistries.org, or you, you can look us up on our Facebook page. That information's on the bottom of your screen. And you can watch it on archive because it's a fundamental teaching on the coming of Jesus, 101. You need to know this. But today, we're going to really be diving into Matthew 24, and, and I've got some questions, and then you're going to go into a teaching. But but give us a little bit about a recap from yesterday. It's a, certainly a pleasure to be here with, with all of you and with your viewers. Uh, the teaching yesterday is, is essentially understanding uh, the nature of the, the teaching of Jesus about his second coming. We have the promise of his second coming, so it's a deep hope that we have in our heart. But we really have to understand Jesus' motives in teaching that and how he applies that teaching, what type of response he wants from us. And it's very clear that a lot of the response that we've seen over the years doesn't have anything to do with the type of response that he's asking us to have. He's not asking us to have a response where we can uh, precisely predict the day of his coming. He tells us we, we're not to set dates. Uh, he's, he doesn't want us to be fearful. He doesn't want us to be anxious. He wants us to be watchful. He wants us to be careful. He wants us to uh, expect his return in a responsible way. He wants us to carry out his mission and, be, and walk in obedience to him. These are very different responses than uh, a lot of the responses that, that we've seen. And it really has to do with understanding why he's teaching us what he's teaching us and what that teaching is really about. You know, um, when, when you were teaching yesterday, I, I loved the, the quote that you said from Lester Sumrall. He said that prophecy, or just tell everybody what, what he said. Um, he said prophecy is for confirmation, not for speculation. Uh, we don't get those prophecies so that we can prognosticate the future. We can speculate uh, with a little bit of uh, holy dust on top to justify why we're speculating. That's not what prophetic word is about. Uh, the prophetic word in the New Testament is very much like the prophetic word in the Old Testament, which is, well, what do the prophets say? Live right. Mm -hmm. uh, be ready for God to face a, 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 The prophet Amos says, prepare to meet your God. And so uh, that's really what this, what this message is about. We're living on borrowed time. And, and right. that's basically really what it's about. It's yesterday when, when you were talking, this wasn't something to, to say that, oh, you know, we've got plenty of time here and no, this isn't the season. That's not at all what you were saying or what you were teaching yesterday. But it's something that you, you understand that, that throughout history, it's all been borrowed time, but this is a different day and hour, just like never before. Absolutely. Yes, Jesus uh, told us that we are responsible for interpreting the signs of the times, and we are not to fall into a sleep. We're not to uh, slough these things off and say, well, you know, the, the Apostle Peter himself writes that there will be people uh, toward the time of the coming of the Lord that will say, oh, this has been going on for years and years, and everything just keeps going on the same. Uh, but Peter warns us, he says, they're deliberately forgetting truths about the coming of the Lord. So it's a balancing act mm -hmm. that we need to, we need to walk in. Uh, it's a living truth that has to do with our relationship with the Lord. It's not about uh, simply grasping facts. Uh, it's about understanding and walking with Jesus. And when we walk with Jesus, then when we see the type of things that we're seeing unfolding in our world today, we take stock of those things in light of that relationship, not in light of uh, some uh, fantastical or speculative interpretation of Scripture. Well, let's dive right in. Sounds let's great. Let's do it. I'm, I'm going to read Matthew 24, uh, uh, starting verse 1 through 8. 
And so it says, Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, you see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Explain to us what that scripture means. Well, you know, this passage uh, in Matthew 24, uh, it has parallels, so you can read kind of a different version of it also in the Gospels of Mark and Luke. Uh, But this passage is very well known, uh, probably because it's the first Gospel and the way that Matthew lays the passage out. Uh, Some people call this the Olivet Discourse because uh, Jesus preaches this message when he's uh, on the Mount of Olives after he leaves the temple, as we read in the passage. Uh, It's also known as the Little Apocalypse. In other words, this is kind of like a a mini book of Revelation uh, where Jesus is outlining uh, the events of uh, uh, leading up to his coming and surrounding and the nature of his coming. And obviously uh, the passage goes farther than just these verses, but uh, there's a whole lot uh, even in these verses, Rachel, that we we touched upon. Um, The first thing that I wanna note about this passage is that we're encountering a teaching of the Lord Jesus as he takes on a very specific role. And that is Jesus as the prophet. Now, when we read the Sermon on the Mount, when we listen to his parables, we're hearing Jesus more as a teacher, uh, as a pastor, as as the good shepherd who's, who's teaching and shepherding the flock. But when he steps into this role, he's speaking as the prophet. Now, what what is the role of the prophet? The role of the prophet is to comfort and to confront. And through that uh, sort of uh, confrontational comfort of God's people, what he does is he helps us to understand who God is, helps us understand who we are, and helps us to understand how we are to relate to both God and the world around us. He helps us put these things in perspective. You know, something that's really interesting about this passage is how it begins. Uh, The disciples are there in the temple and they have a national pride. Uh, They're looking at the temple and, you know, if you visit Jerusalem today, uh, the great retaining wall of the Temple Mount is still there. It's known as the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall. And the, the stones are indeed magnificent. This is not something we just have to take on the authority of Scripture. We can see them with our own eyes. It's an amazing sight to see. And it was even more amazing and glorious in that time. And so they were pointing this out. This was a pilgrimage that the Jews would make from all over the Mediterranean world. And they would stand in awe of the beauty of that temple. And as a matter of fact, some of the later Jewish writing says, he who has not seen Herod's temple has not seen beauty. It was absolutely a sight to behold, really a wonder of the ancient world. So they are admiring it and and they're saying what everybody is saying, look how big it is, look how beautiful, look at the size of the stones. And Jesus came back and said, yeah, it's all gonna be knocked down it's all gonna be destroyed. Can you imagine a church finishing its, its building program and it's, it's had stewardship and they've raised all the funds and they're putting the finishing touches and they invite a special preacher to do the dedication of that building and he gets up in the pulpit and says, yeah, this is all gonna be leveled. Not one uh, brick is gonna remain on the other. It's not exactly a seeker friendly uh, message that he was giving, but you know, it's interesting at times like this, when we're looking at the world around us and it seems like everything is coming apart. It seems like nothing is holding together. We have upheaval in the physical realm and the natural order. We have disease that we haven't faced before and, and we're dealing with uh, 
We're dealing with the economic fallout of that. We're dealing with civil unrest. We're dealing with geopolitical tensions where other countries are jostling. And, and is there really going to be peace? And, you know, there's talk about uh, China and the South China Sea and uh, other uh, alliances that our country depended on that maybe uh, can we really depend on those? And, and so um, Jesus speaking as prophet is not something that strikes us uh, when everything is going our way, is very comforting. This is not exactly a go-to passage. There's not too many people putting this on a bumper sticker or a fridge magnet that they can get up and read it every morning and say, wow, that just makes me feel so good to hear that it's all going to be leveled. Uh, but when things like this happen to us, when we have these troubles in the world, these are the passages that we go to. Because it's kind of a paradox, but we find comfort in them because we know that God is on top of it. We know that God knew that it was going to happen mm -hmm. and it's explained to us. This is Jesus speaking as prophet. And so when Jesus says this, they then leave and the disciples come to him and they say, what is the sign of your coming? This is very, very important because it speaks to what we talked about, talked about yesterday. Jesus didn't come back and say, look, didn't I tell you? Uh, there's no date setting. There's no way of knowing when I'm coming. He didn't say that. They said, what's the sign of your coming? And he said, well, let me tell you what the sign of my coming is going to be like. There is going to be this. There's going to be that. There's going to be the other thing. There's going to be all these different types of upheavals. There's going to be spiritual deception that goes on. False messiahs, false teachers. There's going to be political upheaval, uh, wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be uh, uh, natural disasters of different kinds. There's going to be uh, earthquakes and there's also going to be famines, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's along the line of pestilence. It's very interesting, uh, as, as we noted yesterday, we're missionaries to Ecuador. And the COVID crisis has hit Ecuador in a way that very few places in the United States can even relate to. Uh, the city where we're ministering, the city of Guayaquil, the largest city in that country, uh, during the peak of this crisis, has a, has a death rate that's four times that of New York City. Wow. Now, I'm not taking anything away from the trials that different people have suffered. I'm not diminishing at all the losses that people in the United States have suffered from this. You know, if you lose a loved one to this terrible disease, you've lost that loved one. And that's something that we need to reach out and comfort people about. But in Ecuador, it's so bad that they had to do a, a mass grave. Mm. Uh, people are, are suffering terribly and uh, you lose a breadwinner. A lot of people can't work and so starvation comes, famine, exactly what Jesus talked about here. So these upheavals, it's, it's very interesting because Jesus is speaking with a broad brush stroke, but he's being specific at the same time. And so these are things that he's saying, look, when you see these things happening, be on your guard. He doesn't say uh, set a date. He doesn't say run up your credit cards. He doesn't say indebt yourself, but he does say uh, be on your guard for these things and beware of them and understand that they're necessary. That's what he says. These things must take place. You know, um, as you were talking, I've in, in, in talking about the temple, I've been to Israel, I don't know how many times. And and last year they just redid the area where you can actually go underneath where the 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 Wailing Wall is, and 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 it shows it gives illustrations and drawings of what the temple probably looked like, and yeah. and you get down to the bottom, and so you see the cracked stones, you yeah. see the cracked Jerusalem stone, because yep. that's what it is. It's a Jerusalem stone. It's a type of limestone, yes. and it's cracked, and you can see all that. And it's amazing. And these aren't just like little rocks. These are massive, sure. thick stones. And, and you were talking, we were talking a little bit earlier, and you were, you were telling me how long it actually took to build the temple. Yes. And so share a little bit about that. Well, the temple uh, was uh, begun in 19 BC. So 19 years uh, before the birth of Christ uh, is when the temple uh, uh, was first mm -hmm. the, laid, the first stones were laid. Um, the temple wasn't completed until the year 66 AD. So that's 
over 30 years after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, they were still working on the temple. It was, it was this thing that took the better part of a century, and it was completed in the year 66, and four years later, Jesus' prophecy was exactly fulfilled. The Romans came in, and they leveled the temple. And if you uh, stand, if, if anybody's ever been to Israel, you see even just see pictures, mm -hmm. people standing at the wailing wall praying. If we could get in a time machine and go back in time, where the people are standing praying mm -hmm. is 50 feet above the street that Jesus would have walked. Yes. Because there's 50 feet full of rubble because the Romans destroyed that temple and they shoved it off that temple it's mount. Built, Jerusalem is built in layers. And yes. so it's layers upon layers. Yes. So Jesus's words were fulfilled precisely uh, within the lifetime of, of a number of the apostles. Um, and, and, and th this really leads to the other question. People say, wait a minute, Jesus is talking about these things. Didn't, didn't these happen in 70 AD? Uh, didn't, uh, and, and even aside from that, haven't we seen these type of upheavals all throughout history? Haven't sure. we seen these things throughout history? And the answer is absolutely yes. Mm -hmm. We have seen these things throughout history. But again, going back to prophecy is for confirmation mm -hmm and not for speculation. Mm -hmm. And we see these things throughout history and certainly they're part of the drum roll. They're part of this, this upheaval, these birth pains that he talks about. Uh, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter eight says, um, the creation is in birth pains up to the present time. So there's these birth pains that are going on. So somebody might say, well, what's the difference between those and the birth pains that well, come let, let, right let me, before the end? Let me stop you right there for a second because there might be somebody watching and, and they read this and they hear birth pain. Well, what is a birth pain? What does that mean? What, what does that right. mean in, in context of the scripture? Right, well, that's an excellent question. Um, Jesus is actually using language uh, that he didn't, he didn't uh, invent that language. He is standing in the same uh, vein as the prophets of the Old Testament. And if you read in the Old Testament, you can read in the prophets, Jeremiah, Micah, you can read uh, in Isaiah, that they use this illustration of a woman giving birth. And the, the trial that comes with that, the difficulty that comes with that. Jesus actually uses this with his disciples at the Last Supper. He says, you're gonna go through a time of suffering like a woman giving birth and the world's gonna rejoice, but you're gonna be grieving. But afterwards, when the child is born, you're going to have your time of joy. And Jesus is using that illustration. He's saying, these trials are like a childbirth and the coming of the Lord brings on those birth pains these upheavals, that's why he says it's necessary that they must happen. We, we live in a world um, where there's been so many conveniences, where we've had so many things going our way. Uh, we get instantaneous uh, uh, entertainment. We get instantaneous food. Uh, we get uh, instantaneous news. Everything is according to the way we want it. Uh, and Jesus is describing a time in which everything seems to fall apart. Mm -hmm. And it's falling apart because there's a birthing that's happening. Mm -hmm. There's a birthing that's happening. Um, I personally, uh, never been pregnant, uh, never given birth to a child. It's a um, good thing. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. it's a, myst a mysterious thing. But I've talked to people who have, and it's painful. It's a painful, difficult uh, trial and time uh, in, in a woman's life. It has to happen though, if that child is gonna come forth. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is using that illustration. And we can kind of mine that illustration. And, and I, I, I think we, we sometimes need to kind of camp out there a little bit and understand the ripple effect of him using that illustration because it helps us to understand um, this is part of it. It's, 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 the, it's the nature of his coming just like the nature of a woman giving birth is child pains, is birthing pains uh, that ultimately lead to a new world, a new life. 
in the same way, that's what Jesus is saying. So this is, so when you're talking about birthing pains, it's creation, it's creation groans. Creation right. groans out for the coming of the Lord. Is that not correct? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, that's exactly how the book of Revelation describes what is to come in the wake of Jesus' coming. It's a new creation. It's a new heavens. It's a new earth. You know, um, the Apostle Paul says that in the Lord we go from glory to glory. We go from one level of glory, one level of conformity to Jesus' image to another. And that's God's plan until we see him face to face. Everybody wants the glory, but nobody wants to go through the difficulty and the trial that, that is necessary. It's like, it's like in ministry. P people want to all of a sudden be a pastor or be on stage or they don't want to do the work to... Yeah. They don't want to just be a pastor. They want to be a pastor of 5,000 people. There you go. <laughs> yeah. They, 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 they want everything just to, to, to fall in their lap. And, and sadly, there's been, you know, the impression that's been given to people is, hey, this is about uh, celebrity. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus lived in a different world. Yes. Um, and, and he was teaching us a different, a different truth. And so uh, there's, there's, there's a, again, we're back to the question of balance. Jesus is speaking broadly. Uh, he's speaking in a way that is nonspecific, but he's speaking in a way that those who walk close to him, when these things come to pass, we sort of perk up inside because we're looking forward to his coming. We have a, a longing for his coming and we can put these things in perspective. I, I'm gonna give you my personal uh, sense uh, of these things and, and the whole confirmation versus speculation. Mm -hmm. We can't set any dates. Uh, but I will say this, not only are we 2,000 years closer mm -hmm. to the Lord's coming than we were when Jesus spoke these words, but certain things are coming to pass in ways that even 50 years ago weren't in place. Sure. Uh, we have, or, or in the days of my grandfather, mm -hmm. um, we now have nuclear weaponry. We now have supersonic weapons. We now have the internet. We now have uh, travel, ease of travel, where anybody can be on basically any place on the planet within 24 hours. We're dealing with a much smaller world and a much uh, more globalized economy. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got the United Nations. Uh, we've got um, a connectivity between peoples that has never existed before. Many people have speculated about passages, for example, in Revelation and say, how could this possibly literally be fulfilled where all the peoples of the world are seeing these things? Well, now we read them and it's entirely natural for us to read those things. We're the first generation really to be in the place to read those things. So that's the balance that we need to have. I'm not setting a date, but I am saying these sh things should give us pause. We should, we should take Peter's word Words very, very to, much to heart, where we shouldn't be lulled and say, well, you know, everything's going on the same way as it always has. Everything is most definitely not going on the same way as it always has. Well, there are many, many truths that you're going to get into today, and, and you're going to dive right into those. But we don't want you to go anywhere because uh, Dr. Thomas is going to be teaching, and it's something that you do not want to miss. But we're going to pause for just a second, and we'll be back right after this. Often throughout the Bible, we see examples of God's people praying scripture, allowing God's word to shape their prayers. Dr. Bob Rogers has just released his book, Power Prayers. This book has 21 chapters from the word of God where you can use these to help form your own prayers. Praying God's word enriches our prayer life to pray over a variety of issues in spiritual proportion. It is one of the most powerful ways to build up your spirit man while positioning yourself within these passages of Scripture as you seek God. As our way of saying thank you for sending your best gift of support to this ministry, Dr. Rogers would like to send you your copy of Power Prayers. Simply go to our website at bobrogersministries.org or call 502-962-9650 to donate and request Power Prayers today. Okay, we wanna take another look at the Olivet Discourse. Uh, this passage from Matthew 24, 
that Rachel and I visited a little bit earlier. And we're just looking at the first eight verses of uh, this chapter in the book of Matthew. Uh, Jesus, in response to his disciples' question, uh, he launches into uh, a series of events or types of events that he says are going to mark the time leading up to his coming. The first thing he says is don't be deceived. And he talks about a time of spiritual and religious deception. So he says there's gonna be false prophets, there's gonna be people that are coming, they're gonna be claiming to be him, they're gonna be claiming to be like him or coming in his name, uh, but they're gonna be uh, leading people astray. They're gonna be leading people down a road that doesn't square with the teaching that he himself has laid out that, that is true biblical teaching. It veers off from that. So it's a time of spiritual deception that we can understand. The second is, he describes a time of unparalleled strife between peoples and kingdoms. A better way to, to translate this is between different ethnicities, different ethnic groups, and, and uh, he talks in terms of what we would call geopolitical strife. So between different kingdoms uh, and different peoples, there's strife rising up. Uh, the word that's translated a lot of times in different versions, the Bible says nation will rise against nation. Well, we as moderns, we look at that and we say, oh, uh, America is going to fight against uh, China or something like that. Uh, that's really the reference to kingdoms of, against kingdoms. When it's nations against nations, we're talking about different ethnic groups being at war with one another. And Jesus warns us that this is going to lead up to his coming. And then lastly, he talks about unparalleled natural disasters, earthquakes, famines, difficulties like this. And as we mentioned uh, in, the, in the previous session, uh, we can easily point out, boy, we've had these type of things throughout history. Uh, we can point to different times. As a matter of fact, uh, at least to this point over the last several months, uh, we haven't had it as hard as maybe even people who are grandparents during the Great Depression or World War II or when there was a, a smallpox or polio, different uh, sicknesses that were out. And so some people say, well, this is just a comparative. Maybe we're, we've gotten a little bit soft. Uh, and uh, things, are, uh, uh, things are, are not as bad as they were in previous times. That's true and it's not true uh, because there, Jesus is pointing to kind of a combination of things that are going on at once and they're going on in a global context. And as we talked earlier, there's a globalism that's going on right now that has me on, a little bit on the edge of my seat uh, and, and looking and, and having a deep sense of I need to really prepare myself, not fear, not anxiety, but a time of preparedness uh, toward the Lord. Now, I, I don't know when the Lord is coming. I'm not saying that the Lord is coming within a certain period of time, but it's very important that you understand, I'm not saying that he's not. We simply can't set dates, but we look at these things and we understand these are signs that Jesus gave that when we see them in this combination on a global scale, that we're to, we're to sit up and we're to pay attention. And he says a couple of things about these. As we said earlier, he calls these the beginning of birth pangs. And he says, don't be alarmed. These things have to happen. It is necessary for these things to happen. Birth pains we talked about. Birth pains, that's an illustration that is used uh, to talk about uh, the coming of a new age, the coming of a good thing, but comes through pains and difficulties. That's not something that we like to think of. We think that bad things come bad ways and good things come good ways. But Jesus uses the illustration of childbirth to say, you know what, something good, something very good beyond your imagining, I has not seen nor ear heard nor entered into the heart of, of humankind what God has prepared for those who love him. That's how, how heaven is described to us. That's a good beyond any good we've ever imagined or experienced, but it's gonna come through birth pains. It's gonna come through difficulties. And that's a truth that we need to settle on. We need to receive from the prophetic voice of the Lord. Now you may ask, why? Why do birth pangs have to happen? Why does it have to come this way? 
we read the scriptures and Jesus is saying it does have to happen this way, but why does it have to happen this way? I want to illustrate it to you this way. At Jesus' first coming, he came humbly. He came by his own choice. He stripped himself of glory. You can read that in Philippians chapter 2. It says, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Jesus deliberately made himself a common man. Uh, Isaiah chapter 53 says there was nothing about him that we would be especially attracted to him. Nothing, there was no sign on him that said, hey, this is the Messiah, you need to recognize him. It was something that he came as a normal, ordinary person, just like all of us. And he came, but he came anointed with the spirit without limit. And he was able to do tremendous miracles. And his teachings were like nothing that anybody had ever heard before. The signs were abundant that even though to the naked eye, he was just a normal man, it was very clear what his identity was. And he proclaimed his identity. That coming, Jesus, gentle, it says he came, when he came into Jerusalem, he didn't come on a, on a war horse. He didn't come on a, a, a stallion or a charger. He came on a donkey's foal. He came gentle. He came mild. But even so, it led to tremendous upheavals. It led to the fallout. Simeon, when he held Jesus as a baby, looked at Joseph and Mary and said, this child is destined to cause the rising and falling of many in Israel. So Jesus' first coming, as mild as he came, caused upheaval and caused fallout and caused uh, people's hearts to be revealed. That's very, very important. That Jesus, when he shows up, he shows things for what they are. He shows people for what they are. He lays bare their motive and their character. He reveals what's really inside of them. And that was just his first coming. And through that, the world was changed. The, the church was born. The, the, the gospel went out. And, and within decades and, 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 and really short centuries, it, it upended the entire Roman Empire, the most powerful empire that the world had ever seen. It upended it. And, and, and the church was, was planted and, and established and now is all around the world. That was a tremendous upheaval. Now let's put that in perspective. What's it going to be like when he comes again? When he comes again, he won't come as the lamb. He'll come as the lion. This time he is coming on a charging war horse. This time where he spoke the message on the Mount of Olives, it says his feet are going to touch and it's going to split from, from north to south. And Jesus is going to come and he's going to claim his own. This is what birth pangs are about. Birth pains are about the creator drawing close to his creation. Everything that's around us that we see, the sky, the stars, the moon, the sun, the mountains, the rivers, the trees, every human being around us, even our very consciousness, our mind, our spirit within us, all of that exists by the will of the Lord. When the Lord draws near to his creation, let me just put it this way, his creation loses its cool. His creation loses its composure and his creation becomes unglued, starts to come apart at the seams. It's revealed for what it is. Just as Simeon said, hey, this child, he's gonna cause the revealing of many hearts. In the same way, the closer we get to the coming of the Lord Jesus, the more that this creation trembles and quakes. That's why there's earthquakes. There's these things, I, I understand there's a, there's a geological, geological explanation, just like there's a medical explanation for uh, the coronavirus, and there's an economic explanation for the economy that's going on. We can, we can look at those. Those are the disciplines of man, and we're not discounting them. We're simply saying that underneath them all are spiritual truths and reasonings. And those things are all triggered by the drawing near of the Lord. There's a melting down that happens as the Lord comes near and the creation loses its composure. This time, he's not coming 
incognito. He's not coming disguised. He's coming in fully revealed glory as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he's bringing into being, he's birthing into being this new heavens and this new earth. As, we, as we've mentioned a couple of times, we're living on borrowed time since the resurrection. Everything that we've got is free and above, uh, above and beyond by the by the sheer mercies of God. God is entirely justified once Jesus rose from the dead to call it done, that he'd had enough, that he'd had enough of human sin, he was gonna choose his own, those who had turned to him in repentance, he was gonna, he was gonna usher in the new uh, heavens and the new earth and that was gonna be it, but he's waited very patiently. He doesn't want any to perish and you know what else? He wants a great big family. I personally am so glad that he waited for me to come to repentance so that I might know him. And we need to use this time that others uh, might know him. We need to recognize that we're living on borrowed time and the instability that's in the world is a, is a, is a foreshock. It's a birth, it's a contraction is what it is. The, the book of Romans tells us in Romans chapter eight that, that all of creation has been subjected to futility. Another translation says frustration, not by its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope, there's that word again, hope, that it would be brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. What is it doing? It's groaning. It's groaning in birth pangs. We need to take stock of that. Now, I, I wanna share something about the book of Revelation. And it speaks specifically to this. If you read from Revelation uh, chapter six, verse one through verse eight, you're gonna get this famous passage and time restricts us a little bit. So I'm not gonna read the passage out loud, but you can read it and get your Bible and take, take a look at that. It describes what are commonly known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And this is the, this is the point in the book of Revelation where the Lamb of God has taken the sealed scroll from the hand of the one seated on the throne and begins to break the seals. And as he breaks the first seal, the first of the four living creatures cries out, come, and out comes a white horse. And then he breaks the second seal and out comes a red horse. And then he breaks the third seal and out comes a black horse. And then the fourth seal, he breaks and out comes a, a sickly green pale horse. Those four horses are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And if you'll read that passage, you'll see in that passage a strong parallel between the events that are associated with each one of those horses and those horsemen and what Jesus describes in Matthew 24. The first horse is the white horse. He's given a crown and he's, and he's given a, a bow and he's, he's sent out on conquest. And the second is a red horse. And there the rider has a sword and he's given the power to take peace from the earth and cause men to slay one another. And then the third horse is that black horse. And, and that rider has got imbalanced scales and it's, it's economic uh, distress and difficulty. Basically the rich get richer and the poor get poorer as the luxury items are, are stable in their prices but the daily staples uh, have skyrocketing inflation and, and people can't afford to eat. And then the last horse, the pale rider is death. Now if you look at those different uh, cataclysmic events, these, these terrible things that happen, you're gonna see that they parallel exactly what is going on in, in uh, chapter uh, 24 of Matthew. Now, what's the significance of these four writers? Well, first, you have to understand what the four living creatures are. The four living creatures symbolize the created order. They symbolize all of creation because they symbolize the different aspects. There's the one that resembles a man, the one that resembles a lion, the one re resembles an ox, and the one that resembles an eagle. They're representative of the whole created order. And one after another, they, they call out a cry. And that cry is, come, come. Now I want to set something to rights here. The book of Revelation is a book that focuses on the meaning of numbers quite a bit. And certain words and phrases occur a significant number of times. 
seven times Jesus says, I am coming. Seven, we know, is the number of spiritual completion. And so seven times in the book, Jesus says, I am coming, I am coming, I am coming. All throughout the book, from the first chapter to the last, but sprinkled throughout the book, seven occurrences where he says, I'm coming. But when we understand this passage in chapter six, we understand that Jesus saying, I am coming, is responding to seven cries in the book where seven different voices say, come. They're crying out. They're saying, Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. Each one of those voices that cries out, come, is, is a different voice. But here's, here's one I want to drive home to you. These four living creatures, when we line up the seven times Jesus says, I am coming, and the seven times that the cry goes forth, come, we understand that these four living creatures aren't crying to the horsemen to come. They're crying out to Jesus to come. They're crying out Manath, uh, Maranatha. They're crying out exactly as Paul describes in Romans chapter 8, that the whole creation is groaning in pains of childbirth. It's longing for the, the appearing of the Son of God and the glorification of God's children that we were given our resurrection bodies. They're, 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 the creation is crying out. So when, when we have these four living creatures that, that have the wings and they're crying, holy, 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 that's the created order crying out, saying to the Messiah, come, come back, revisit your creation, set things right. Now, when they cry out, what comes forth? Disaster, one disaster after another comes forth. And you say, wait a minute, that's not what they asked for. They asked for Jesus to come. That's right. And Jesus is answering that cry. But just in, in full conformity, in full consistency in the Word of God, just like Jesus said, you want to know, my disciples, when my coming will be? You want to know the sign of my coming? I'm going to tell you the sign of my coming. The created order is going to start to come apart at the seams it's going to start to reveal itself for what it is, that it's temporary, that it's not going to last, that it's not meant to be eternal. There's a new heavens and a new earth that's meant to be eternal. And when the Creator draws near, it's going to come apart. We have to ask a basic question, going back to the illustration of the birth pangs. Do the labor pains cause the child, or does the child cause the labor pains. From the outside, it looks like the labor pains bring about the coming of the child. But the truth of the matter is, it's the coming of the child that brings the labor pains on. As Jesus gets closer and closer, we have to understand that these things are coming about. We look at these things and we say, boy, um, these are going to cause the coming of the Lord. No, no, no. It's the coming of the Lord that's causing these things. It's the coming of the Lord that's causing this global Babel. If we look in the Old Testament, we can see the Tower of Babel, people banding together, people trying to unify around something that is anti-God, that is anti-Christ, that, that defies God. Uh, Psalm 2 says, uh, the, the nations gather, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? That's, again, that's part of the, the sign of the coming of the Lord. So these are, these are things that we need to take to heart. We need to, we need to consider and we need to ask ourselves, how should we respond to these things? How should we uh, live our lives? Well, we should continue to be Christians, just as he has taught us. We need to abide in him. We need to press into him. We need to be fervent and faithful in prayer. And we need to be fervent in our witness. We need to forgive one another. Oh, saints of God, if you've got bitterness in your heart, now's the time to unload that. Now's the time to offload that. Now's the time to let your heart be filled with the things of God. And I want to tell you, it's an upstream battle because Jesus is telling us, listen, right when you're trying to be more spiritual, 
there's a lot of spiritual deception going on. Right when you're trying to be more harmonious with your brothers and sisters around you, the world around is going to be saying, you need to hate that person. They're not the right color. You need to hate that person. They're not from the right country. You need to hate that person. They don't speak your language. There's going to be this strife that's pushing back at you. And in the power of God, we are supposed to say, no, I'm going to abide in Christ. I'm not going to hate anybody. I'm not going to have bitterness in my heart. I'm not going to fall for, for a, 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 a false gospel. I'm going to embrace the love of God. I'm going to walk in the things of God. I'm not going to close in and hoard to myself. I'm going to be generous and I'm going to, I'm going to give so that the work of God can go forward and the lost can be reached. These are the things that we're supposed to walk in. You know, I, I want to focus just on a couple of scriptures. Matthew 24, 6, we read it. Jesus said, don't be alarmed. He said, do not be alarmed. That's a tough thing when you're seeing the world fall apart around you, to not be alarmed. But Jesus said, don't be alarmed. I'm on top of it. I know this. I've, I've told you ahead of time so you wouldn't be deceived. Don't be alarmed. John 16 verses 22 and 23, he says, you're going to suffer now. The world is going to rejoice. You're going through a difficult time, but the time is coming when you're going to have joy and nobody's going to take away your joy. Just like the woman rejoices because she's brought a child into the world. And lastly, Luke chapter 21, verse 28, where Jesus says, when you see all these things, not one or the other or this or that, but he says, when you see them all, they're all working together. They're all unfolding before your eyes. He's saying, look up because your redemption draws nigh. I want to close with one comment. God is very patient. God is slow to anger. And God, um, as Rachel mentioned yesterday, God is above time. He has transcendence above. He's looking at the timeline. He's not confined to it. Uh, so it can seem to us as human beings who are bound by time that um, God moves very, very slowly. Um, when it comes to mercy, yes, he, he's, he's very slow to anger. But understand this, when it's time for God to move, he charges like a bull elephant and he moves very, very quickly. And anybody who's walked with the Lord for any amount of time knows that when he moves, he moves very quickly. How many times in my life I've said, God, when are you gonna move? When are you gonna answer my prayers? With the psalmist I've prayed, oh, how long, oh Lord, how long? But then when he moved, I was holding onto my hat saying, God, you're moving too fast. There's too much going on at once. Understand that as we have experienced that maybe in our own lives, that's what the whole world is going to experience. That Jesus has waited and waited and waited and waited. But when he comes, it's going to be sudden and it's going to be final. So let's take stock of the birth pains. Let's not write them off and say, well, we've seen it all before, brothers and sisters. We haven't seen anything yet. God bless you. Thank you for watching today. Call us now. We are ready to take your call and to get you the help you need today. We can help. Don't wait. Call now. And welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that teaching because it's been incredible. Tomorrow you don't want to miss the program either. We're going to be going back into end times, end time prophecy, and, and the footsteps of Jesus. And so, Dr. David, you have been just incredible this week. Thank you so much for being Thank with you, us Rachel. today. We just have a few moments left in our program, but I want to remind everybody about your book, and Thank they you. can get this on Amazon. That's Tell right. everybody a little bit about this book. Okay, this book is uh, formatted as a 40-day devotional, but really it's a, it's a biblical fiction retelling of the passion of Jesus. It begins with his anointing at Bethany. It goes through Passion Week. And I really focus on um, some characters. All the characters are in the Bible. They're all, they're all there in the story. 
and I, I really develop them and, and I tell their story uh, according to scripture and also some things that, that very well could have been. Uh, and uh, it's, it's saturated in prayer and it really focuses us on, uh, on enjoying the Lord and, and, and dedicating ourselves, giving ourselves to the Lord. The candle is a fool and you can get it on Amazon, just go on Sweet. Amazon and you can order that. And so you wanna make sure that you, you pick this up. But as always, during the course of the program, we've had people that have called, they've had questions, they've had prayer requests, and that number is still gonna be available even after the end of this program, it's 502-962-9650. But we just want to take a couple minutes and, and we want to agree in prayer. And, and Dave, I, I want you to pray for everybody that's watching. We've had many people that have called in for healings and that, uh, that they would have wisdom to discern these times because that's really what we're talking about today. And Amen. so just pray for those people that are watching right now. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the power of your word and the comforting strength of your Holy Spirit. God, we ask, Lord, that the wisdom of those scriptures would be upon everybody who's listening. That, God, we would understand the, ti the times that we live in, that we would take to heart these difficulties, and God, we would press into you. Father, we ask for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit right now in people's homes. God, that people would be healed, that the conviction of the Holy Spirit would come out into their lives, their families would be restored, and they would draw close to Jesus. We pray it in his name, amen. Amen, amen. And I wanna encourage you, if you missed yesterday's program, you don't want to miss that. You can go back, you can watch it on archive. You can go to bobrogersministries.org. You can look at our Facebook page. It's also archived there. So I encourage you, go and watch it. And, and you know, it's, it's not just enough to, to watch a sermon or to be in church and just hear the pastor or hear the preacher speak. That is for you to go back and you to read your Bible and for you to educate yourself and let the Holy Spirit work through you. And so I encourage you, go watch yesterday's program, tape today, go back, watch it again, and we will see you tomorrow because you don't want to miss tomorrow. We'll see you tomorrow on Word Alive.